hard. Huh. Now I'm getting all emotional. But I'm cool. I'll, I'll do I, Yeah. I'm gonna get the prostitution part and the stripping and all that. Yeah, I'll get you. I can get you. Yeah, do you, do you want to tell us um, how you got the scar on your head? Yeah, I do. Um, there's some situations that um, I think um, all addicts, and especially women, especially women, we put ourselves in these situations um, that are basically deadly. Um, and the drugs are so overpowering that we don't realize exactly what, what we're doing. It doesn't, actually it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, I got into a car with a man um, in Hunters Point, in San Francisco, California. It was 2 a.m. in the morning and um, I took it a crack. And as I blew out the hit, I got spooked. And I asked him to pull over and he said, you're not going anywhere. So I opened the door thinking that he'd pull over and he gunned it. And I went to go jump out and I cracked the left side of my head on a fire hydrant. I was knocked out completely cold. This is what I found out later. He threw me in the back of his uh, red pickup truck. Um, and took me out to Revere Street, which is out in Double Rock and Hunters Point, San Francisco. And when I woke up, I was sitting against a fence and my head, my shoulder was broken. My head was completely split open and he was standing over me with a Budweiser beer, contemplating what to do with me because we were right by the bay. So now it's 4 a.m. and you have a probably a 70 year old man and a you know young you know a 24 year old woman who is 4 a.m and she's really hurt and um uh i knew he was going to throw me in the bay i knew it i knew he was going to throw me in the bay absolutely um He raped me, and then he raped me again. And at one point, while raping me the second time, he said, oh, you stupid cunt, um, you fucking, you, uh, you know, um, uh, you fucked up, and now I gotta start over. And they started to beat me in the head with one of the clubs that you used to lock your car with. Mm -hmm. One of those clubs. Um, and then once he was done raping me, actually let me back up. I remember while he was raping me, putting my head against the window and, and the window was up and the rain was coming down off the window. And I just remember looking at the window and the bay and just watching the rain on the outside of the window trickle down going, this is it. This is it right here. At 24, 23 years old, this is it. This is it. This is going to be it. Um, when he was done raping me the second time, he said he was going to kill me. He said, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to, ha I can't, I, I can't let you live. I raped you, you know, your head, but your head's busted open. You're going to go to the police. I, I can't, I'm sorry. You're a really nice girl, but I can't let you live. I cannot let you live. I don't really understand what happened. To this, to this day, um, except that somebody had to be watching out for me because um, I said to him this, I'm gonna call him Sam. I said, Sam, you know what? This was completely my fault. Now remember, you have a 24 year old young woman with her head literally busted open and all I could hear was suction. When I ha was had my hand across my head, and my shoulder was broken so I couldn't move. And I said to him, Sam, this was my fault. This was my, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You don't have to kill me. Listen, I actually care about you. Why don't we do this? Why don't you drive me back to my tent and um, I need some clothes 
and we can, you and I can leave from here because I truly care about you. I really care about you, and I'm very sorry. This is my fault. That is how I got out of that one. He actually drove me back to my tent, and the minute my foot hit that ground, I ran so fast. I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my life. Now, I can tell you right now, Sam is not here anymore. The only thing I'm gonna tell you is this. He went swimming, swimming uh, uh, over the bridge the old fashioned way. You wanna tell us a little bit about the prostitution and the stripping? Yeah. Um, when I was 21, um, I was walking down the street and a man said to me, no, wait, wait, let me back that up. My boyfriend said to me, because there was some hooker standing right there, oh, you can make 10 times as much as they do. And here you have a young woman from Santa Barbara, California, who's never done it, right? Uh, you know, never done anything, right? I'm straight, or, you know. I mean, I was messing on drugs, but, you know. And I said, no, I can't make more than they can. Oh, baby, of course you can. That's how the, uh, well, no. That's how, actually, that's how the prostitution started. Here in San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, on Post and Mason. I used to stand on Post and Mason um, with a few girls. Um, I started, uh, I didn't have a pimp, but I started on midnight and um, uh, I leave about 4 a.m. Um, I've stripped at, um, uh, I've stripped at um, uh, uh, the Tiger's Eye, uh, Mitchell Brothers, Market Street Cinema, uh, 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 the hustler, Larry's, you know, I, I stripped everywhere in the city. Um, I don't do that anymore. Um, um, but any woman that gets into this, into the, it, it, no, let me see back this up. Any woman that is an addict will go to any extreme. We get in cars at 4 a.m. We can end up in trunks. You know, in the Bay, um, we get raped. I've been kidnapped. I've been beaten. Um, yeah. And so today, throughout your experience, do you feel like recovery or possibly going to rehab, that you will be open to that? or? you'll be a possibility to possibly find recovery? Okay, so um, uh, I've been to just about every um, rehab center in this city. Delancey Street, Walden House, uh, Harbor Lights, Epiphany House, uh, uh, Source of Pop Shows, you name it, I've been there. I know in my heart what the tools are in order to stay clean. I know, I know what they are. Um, I was clean for almost five years, but um, as sad as this is to say, honestly, um, for right now, the desire to, to stay clean and to get clean are not there. They're not there. They're just not there. And during the five years, what were you doing in the five years that you were sober? Oh God, um, life was so simple. You know, but it was beautiful. I would get up in the morning, I'd walk my dog, you know, I'd get a cup of coffee, I'd take her to the park. Um, uh, I'd go to lunch, I mean, it was, I'd make my bed, right? Um, I mean, uh, I wash my dishes, I wash my clothes. Things that addicts out here do not do. I've gone months without showering. I've gone days without eating. Um, the only thing that matters out here is that feeling. That's it. The drugs. And when people think, um, that people are out here just begging for money, um, you know, just to get a hit or whatever, there are some days I would gladly trade places with them. You know, I believe that we're all human beings. 
you know, and that we all deserve, you know, help. Thank you so much for joining us today and doing this great interview. I wanted to help a lot of people and I just want to say thank you again for being here today and your message to everybody out there that might want to try drugs or the young people that are using fentanyl now and so many... Please don't do it. Yeah, what don't would you do say? it. Do not do it, please. Do not do it. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning when I was in my 20s with the heroin, oh, I won't do it, I won't do it. I'm here to tell you right now. Um, I've been I've been using drugs for many years, but fentanyl, your first hit m might no not might it will be your last. It will be your last. There'll be no more uh, the air to smell. You know, uh, walking on the sidewalk, giving somebody a hug. That's it. It's over. It's over. It's gone. It's done. It's done. It is done. And and I'm a hardcore addict. And that stuff scares me. It terrifies me. It really does. It terrifies me. And I walked into a couple of situations where I didn't know I almost, you know, I, I, like I told you, I almost was going to do it. I didn't mean to. But, you know, um, I am, um, uh, uh, let me see, uh, the five years that um, I said I was clean, when I, I had moved up to the Russian River, when I, Russian River when I came back, over three quarters of those people are dead because of fentanyl. Because of fentanyl. And the police, I'm sorry, but they don't do anything. We go to Turk and Hyde. Everybody is standing there with foil in their hands. Everybody. Smoking a pipe, uh, seeing the bus stops. They're everywhere. They're standing right there in broad daylight. The police go by every day and go like this. You know, hey, good morning, everybody. You're standing right there, right there. Would you almost say that they actually want people to go through that? Yeah, no, I believe that. Yes, I absolutely 100% believe that the police want these people to go, to die. Yes. Job security? Yep, absolutely. Job security, uh, 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 get rid of the undesirables, right? Get rid of the people that don't matter. If we can get rid of them, let them die. Let them die. Look, hey, uh, here. Oh, here's a really good point. Um, SSI, SSI. Let's get the drug addicts on SSI, and let's give them that big check in the beginning. And hey, to an addict, twenty-five grand is a lot of money. They won't even go through a thousand. By, by tomorrow, they'll be dead. And guess what? The government society never has to pay them again. And in their eyes, they got rid of the undesirables. In the last year, would you say that there's an increase in overdoses of fentanyl? Over 80%. Like I told you, every week, once a week, on Turk and Hyde, I watched the 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 the, the, corner, the, the, the medical examiner uh, a van pull up, and in fact, I was about four days ago. Um, uh, they pulled up on uh, um, right on Turk and Hyde, and I, I was walking by my dog, and I just decided to ask because I saw a body in there, in the back of the van. There was a body in the back of the van, you know, with with all wrapped up, and they were going up to get another body. In, in one of the hotels, and they're bringing him down. And um, I asked him, I said, what is, what happened to this person? They said, overdose fentanyl. It's the number one killer right now in San Francisco. It's exactly what he said. Do you think it's bigger than the crack epidemic? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Without a doubt, 100%. And I'm willing to try anything. And I'm terrified of that. I'm terrified. I, I have um, accidentally, like I said, almost, almost done it twice without my, without my intention, you know, like being given it. Um, and um, uh, 
and almost kill me. And and like I said, once it's over, it's over. It's over. Like what do they say? I'm uh, death is one appointment you cannot reschedule. You know, once you're dead, that's it. You can't say, oh, can I die tomorrow? No, you can't. That's it. That's it. And one last thing. Yeah. If if your family is to see this video, is there a message that you want to send to them? Oh my gosh. Um. Yeah. Um. In my own family, um, which uh, a lot of them are from Sinaloa, Mexico, um, uh, but they live here in, in California. Um, uh, Especially in a Mexican family, um, everything is keep it indoors. Keep everything indoors. You know, don't talk about it. Don't let anybody know. We'll, we'll deal with it in here. Um, I was the one, uh, like the black sheep. I was the one person in my family that came out and said, "I have a problem. I'm a heroin addict. I have a problem. I need help." And ever since that day, I have been shunned from my family. I've been shunned because I, I, because I admitted that I had a problem. And so instead of them saying, you know, okay, let us help you, you know, not money-wise, but let us get you somewhere. Um, I was ostracized because I talked about it. But I do believe that if we don't talk about it, nothing is ever going to change. Nothing. If people like you don't don't do things like this, nothing is going to change. People are going to die. You know, this is not the eighties where Nancy Reagan said just say no, you know? This is not the eighties. This is it's not the eighties. People are dying. We're talking about we're talking about people eighteen, seventeen, fifteen, you know, people with kids, women with kids, you know, women, people with dogs with families, that one hit they take of that fentanyl and people find them five days later in a hotel room. Five days later in a hotel room. Can you imagine what a body looks like five days later? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome.